Hey, Pre-Sales Collective, it's your host, James Kakis, and do we have a great episode for you today. Today's episode is titled Creating a Culture of Feedback with Neethi Shah, Director of Solutions Engineering at LiveRamp. If you've worked for me or worked with me, you know I love feedback. I really believe that feedback is critical to our growth and our evolution as professionals, but let's be honest, giving negative or constructive feedback is really hard. And so is receiving it. It takes practice, but more importantly, it takes a willingness to receive it. Nithi has an impressive foundation and approach to feedback, both formally and informally. And you'll hear how feedback is not only encouraged, but appreciated within her team and within her organization. I really enjoyed today's episode and think it is applicable to everyone, regardless if you're in a pre-sale role or not. So definitely get your notepad out. Enjoy today's episode, and hopefully it provides value to you. Hi, Nithi. How are you today? Hi, James. I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for being on the pre-sales podcast. Yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to talking about this. It's it's definitely a topic that I'm very passionate about. <laughs> it is. And for everybody listening, we probably could have recorded an episode before we started recording because we started talking about the subject. I do want to ask you, how have things been during the pandemic, managing a team and and how has your business been? So I moved to Colorado last year. So I've been a remote manager. And so I've had some time to really just manage the team from being at home. With everything that's been going on, you know, work's been definitely a lot busier. We've all have had a lot of meetings. We've had to change how we work because we're no longer in front of clients. And for everyone that's been in pre-sales, you know how important client meetings can be. So I think there are definitely challenges there, but overall, like we're being more intentional about team bonding, bringing people together. And that's not just within our team, but also all of the other teams that we work with. So for example, we're having a trivia team time with our commercial leads on Thursday, which will be a lot of fun. I was going to ask you what you've been doing differently. I've realized that you have to figure out ways to incorporate non-work-related events or conversations because we've lost a lot of our cooler talk or office talk that typically exists between teams. Now, you mentioned that you've been virtual for a while and that does give you a little bit of an understanding on how to manage a team. But for many of us, including myself, it's been a bit of an adjustment. And if you think about it, we're starting to build global teams too, right? So you know, at some point, even if you're in the San Francisco office or New York office or another office, you may be managing people that might be remote or in a different office. And so I think a lot of what we're learning now are things that we can still apply when life goes back to normal and people start going back to the office. Great perspective. And actually, we had Steph Barnett on our podcast a few weeks ago, and she runs an emerging team out of APAC. And what she was talking about is how companies are now become borderless. And people that are entering the workforce especially people right out of college, this is their first job, they're only used to virtual. And it doesn't matter what region you're in, what time zone you're in, people are building culture within it. And it's actually pretty fascinating to hear that perspective. Yeah. And even the onboarding process, right? Not being in the office, I think we're learning a lot about what's working and what's not and how to manage through it. Bill McDermott from ServiceNow today was on the Leadership Next podcast from Fortune. And he was talking about how business will change forever because onboarding and in-person training events that you would usually fly people in, they might be tired from the week before, they're out of the field, they've lost productivity, and it's just not the best human experience. And now how people have adjusted to taking those trainings at home, still being productive, still being able to wake up and go to sleep in their same house will change the way business training operates forever. So that remains to be seen, but I thought it was an interesting take. Yeah. Definitely. I think we're going to learn a lot about just trends in the market with our clients, but also how we function, what's really working and what's not. I mean, I can tell you that a lot of companies at this point to the point you made are realizing, hey, work from home isn't as bad. It's not as tough. It's not something we can't do. Right. And so you start to see companies basically just say, we're going to be work from home and we're going to provide that flexibility now um, because they realize that it's working. It is working. Our buyers are learning it too, not just all the tech companies. So before we get into our main topic of creating a culture of feedback, which I'm really excited to talk about, Nithi, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how you got into pre-sales? So I've gone through a lot of changes through life. 
when I was in college, I was actually a bio major on the pre-med track. And then when I started college, I started taking courses that you have to take as electives. And I took economics and finance. And that was really the turning factor for me. I realized how much I liked it. And I liked the idea of having a practical career path because, you know, for anyone that's seen anyone in medicine, you're studying for a really long time and then doing the residency and all of that. So changed my major to financial economics and started coding on the side with my brother, who's an engineer. And then worked in a few roles before I moved to New York to take on a software engineer role. It was a really good experience because what it helped me realize was I love solving problems, but software engineering was not for me. I really wanted to be in front of clients. I wanted to be able to understand their goals, their pain points, and then solve that through technology, right? So that's when I took a client services and technical lead role at Rich Relevance, my prior company. I had the opportunity to work with the largest brands and in a consulting fashion. And then when I was looking for my next opportunity, I came across LiveRamp. And you know, as I started digging into what LiveRamp offers, that was very exciting. I think the product is intriguing. It's definitely needed in the market. And so I joined the product operations role, which was similar to what I was doing at Rich Relevance. In that role, again, I was working with the largest brands and I got to put my consulting hat on again. And I saw an opportunity to grow out the SA team because at that time, it was a really small team, not a lot of processes, didn't really exist. And so I made the switch and decided to take the opportunity to lead and grow that team. And I've been in that role ever since then. And I would say people management and solutions engineering combo is really the perfect fit for me. Well, it's great that you found your fit, right? Like you have a very interesting journey, but what I hear and we talk to other people in pre-sales, it's not all that uncommon to take these kind of pivots and turns, but sounds like you found your place. That's great. Well, I'm excited to get into our topic today of creating a culture of feedback. From my perspective, feedback is one of those things that is a gift, but if done incorrectly, does not always fall the way that it should. I think that I took feedback for granted at times, both giving and receiving, and didn't always create a culture of feedback. And I think what I've realized the most recently in my career is that not everybody is as receptive to feedback as maybe I might be or you might be. And so creating that culture really starts small and has to expand and grow over time. So I'm really excited to get in this topic. So to start, Nithi, why don't you tell us maybe your general thoughts on feedback? So my blanket statement will be, it's important. I think it's so foundational to being able to grow teams and help them learn and understand what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. And that goes for everybody in the company, whether you're a manager or IC, I think feedback is so foundational. And creating a culture of feedback is necessary because, you know, a lot of times to the point of if a culture exists and people have an easier time to embed into that, because what I've found is a lot of people struggle with providing and receiving feedback, especially when it's critical in nature, right? I think it's easy for us to say good things and hear good things when it starts becoming critical is when people really struggle because they're not sure how it's going to be taken and things like that, which is why creating that culture and making it the norm is really important overall. I couldn't agree more. So what are some ways that you've created a culture and made it part of the norm? One of the things that we encourage a lot is just regular feedback, right? Whether it's between peers, it's between managers and peers or other stakeholders you're working with. It's important to have formal and informal processes around feedback. You shouldn't wait till like a performance review is being done annually to provide feedback because it doesn't give the person, the time to kind of take it in and action on it, right? And so we really encourage regular feedback as much as possible. I think it's also really important to normalize the process of giving feedback, which is communicating with the team what that means and why it's important, things like that. It's important to be able to have some sort of feedback training, like helping them even understand the importance of it, what others have gotten out of it, things like that. And then figuring out the different channels where you can get the feedback. So I think when you think about culture... It's about being able to encourage it at the IC level, but then also with all the other stakeholders that you work with. And the last thing I'll say, actually, that I found to be really helpful is when you are providing critical feedback, try to balance that with positive feedback. I think people take it in a much better way when they're hearing the positive and then they're hearing the critical instead of just the critical. 
I agree. And I actually have a situation in my career that I can still visualize early in my career. Somebody was early in their tech career and we did an early morning demo. It was like six o'clock Pacific time. And after that, we're like, Hey, let's go get a coffee and debrief. And it was like, Hey, I need to know how I did James. And I remember giving him feedback and seeing him be receptive and then giving him feedback and giving him feedback and giving him feedback and seeing his face change. And I still, to this day, have that image in that situation ingrained in my brain as a, oh, wow, that was way too much, way too heavy. That was a fail and actually was not responded well, but it was a good learning lesson for me. But I still visualize that because you're exactly right. And I really like what you said about making sure it's normalized and formal and informal, right? Like that is the way you create a culture is that it's continually part of the process and people just are accustomed to it and used to it. And that reinforcement is really critical to a culture of feedback. Exactly. And I will say, you know, oftentimes when I talk to my ICs, when you're thinking about manager and IC, you know, we're programmed to provide feedback to our ICs. The other way around is something that we're really focusing on at LiveRamp right now. Because I think when you're an IC and you're running into maybe like struggles or challenges with your manager, being able to have a conversation with your manager around that, that's definitely very difficult. And that's so important to normalize as you're thinking about feedback overall. I can reflect on a number of experiences in my career, whether myself or other people have reached out to me on how to handle those types of situations because they're very tough. They really are. But leaders, if you're asking for feedback and trying to create a culture of feedback, I hope that we're the type of people that are more receptive and not on the defensive in that type of situation. Let's talk about the why. Like, Why is creating a culture of feedback so important? Yeah. And it goes back to some of the foundational things, right? When you create that culture, you're basically creating a more positive workplace environment. You're creating a culture where people are open and don't have a fear of being able to say something, right? You're creating that openness. It's promoting trust. It's preventing conflict. I think when you hold a lot of things in, especially when it's critical, it's going to come out in terms of conflict, right? And so you want to really be able to prevent that. And then overall, when you think about growing teams... When they start getting large enough and you're scaling that team, you really need to think about what does performance management look like? At LiveRent, we recently came out with a structure for performance management, and it kind of goes into four parts. We look at KSAOs, which are basically knowledge, skill sets, abilities, and then the other section. And we source that feedback from ICs, managers, and the stakeholders that the ICs are working with. There's also a call evaluation that we take into place. We have a scorecard and then it all ties into leveling. And then ultimately, all of this is an input into individual growth plans, right? But now you're looking at an objective measure versus subjective, right? And so if you're taking all of these things into place, feedback is a really important thing to be able to consider. So I think companies that don't have performance management should really start thinking about what does that look like and how can feedback play into it? That's great. I love hearing that. What was the driver that LiveRamp started putting these mechanisms into place for? The team was small when I first joined. Again, when you're four people and you are still figuring out what your team's responsible for, it's maybe not top of mind at that point. The team started scaling and growing. The organization saw a lot of value coming out of our team. And so if you think about what it means to grow the team further, this is absolutely something that's necessary. And then LiveRamp as a whole, right? We're no longer that startup that we were four or five years ago. We really need to be able to work with all of the stakeholders, especially pre-sales. I mean, I will say we touch almost every team out at LiveRamp. And being able to create that foundation of trust, it's so important. And feedback is absolutely a big driving factor for it. So it really was to scale the company and the team and figure out how we can work better and more efficiently with all of the people that we work with. I love hearing about the company level or higher level and having that cascaded down. I want to ask your thoughts on something that I think is relevant to everyone who's listening to this. And we can maybe break this down into a couple of ways, but what are your thoughts on like peer to peer feedback? So let's call this SE to SE feedback. So my thoughts are that needs to happen, right? You don't want to create a culture of going straight to the manager or talking behind someone's back, especially when that feedback is critical. I think It goes back to the point of if you want to create trusting relationships, whether again, it's peer to peer or peer to like another stakeholder, you really need to be able to create the environment of, 
I can come to you if I'm running into a challenge. I can also come to you if I have something positive to say, and that's okay, right? And so I think in my career and what I found, even when I was an IC, you know, you're always going to run into challenges. People have different personalities. They have different mindsets. They work differently. And so I myself, when I was an IC, I remember working with a commercial counterpart that worked a certain way, right? Not to say that that was wrong or right, but she needed certain things to happen at certain times and she worked a certain way. And I remember having a conversation where we were called SA back then, but the essay that she used to work with, she would text her requests and things like that. And that was okay. When I came into that role, it's a small thing, but you know, the idea of texting me a request, it's not something that I really like to do, right? Because I can't really keep a track of it. And texting for me is more informal. And so I had to tell her like, hey, I understand this is how you worked with the other essay and it's totally fine. But for me, can we stick to email or even Slack if it's just like one-off questions? But the whole texting thing doesn't work for me. Was that hard for you to have that conversation? It was, right? Because I had just started working with her. Um, I really wanted to build a relationship with her. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of kind of giving in, even if they're not comfortable or they don't like something because they just want to be able to build that relationship. But what I've found, and this is actually apart from just feedback, is the more honest you are and the more you can level set expectations and how you work in the line the relationship is better long-term, right? You can give in today, but if you're not liking what's happening, it's going to stay inside of you. And then eventually it's going to come out. So I think it's important for people to realize that it might be tough and it might not be comfortable, but it does lead to stronger relationships long-term. You've mentioned that live ramp is creating a culture, making this part of the norm, informal, formal, You've mentioned some trainings that you've done for your team. Can you expand on that just a little bit further? The two that I'll highlight, one is just the importance of feedback, right? Like, let's talk about this as a group. How are you feeling about giving and receiving feedback? It's important to get a pulse for where your team's at, right? And the training was around the concept of what we're talking about today, a lot of why it's necessary, how does it play into what we're thinking about for the team, And then part two of that was the performance management, right? And when we started having the conversation about around a formal performance management, because feedback plays into it, the fact that the team had an understanding of why we're creating a culture of feedback, it was just an easier conversation to have at the end of the day, right? I think, you know, you can do more formal trainings. We have a sales enablement team. We have a talent enablement team. But for me personally, it was just making sure that the team understands why we're emphasizing feedback so much and in what ways we're going to basically source for it and creating a culture of like, hey, you can come to me if you're feeling a certain way or you're running into a challenge, even if it's with me, right? Like promoting that type of openness is really important. You know, one of the things that I've been really focusing on with my team is having that peer-to-peer feedback. For instance, a demo doesn't go well. Uh, with like maybe another specialty team I see and I get that info. I don't like to go to the manager directly because you're playing telephone. And once you start playing telephone, you don't have all the facts, you're not buttoned up and you can't be as effective. What I like to do is I role play with my team. I'm like, all right, pretend I am this person who maybe didn't do well in the demo. Explain to me how you're going to have this conversation. And I have even found that if we role play over chat, that they are feeling way more comfortable going into that situation than not because not everyone is feeling good about giving their peers feedback, especially as you mentioned, it's critical. And especially if it affects a deal negatively, if a deal was lost or pushed or something in that realm, there's a lot of pressure on us in sales. And so I feel that people have a lot of angst around that topic. Yeah. And I will say from experience, actually, I think it's important to also keep in mind as leaders that you're going to have different levels of experiences, right? Like you're going to have more junior people, you're going to have more senior people. And a lot of times the senior people, again, this isn't like a blanket statement, but they've kind of gone through this if they have enough of the experience or maybe they work at enough companies where they got to see the benefits of what providing feedback look like. But then you have a lot of the junior folks that maybe this is their first job, right? And so they don't really know how to approach it. So I remember someone on my team was having challenges with a peer. And this is important too, as a leader, to be able to guide individually your ICs to think about this in the right way. And she went and talked to the person that she was having a challenge with. And she came back to me and said, that was great. I feel like I'm not keeping things inside of me anymore. I feel like it's out there in the open. And we came out with action items of what we're going to do and how we're going to align better. 
And I just feel better about the whole thing because it was kind of like eating up inside. It was in her, right? And she was feeling it. And every time she had to work with that person, she felt those emotions. I want to ask one question before we continue on some of these topics. AESE feedback is really hard. There's so many times that there is animosity with our sales counterparts and then giving feedback, you know, especially critical feedback is really hard, sometimes non-existent. So do you have any best practices or advice for anyone who's maybe going through a bit of a struggle with their account executive, but is also struggling to give feedback? Yeah. I mean, we honestly have run into that quite a bit. A couple of things that we've done is I've been working very closely with the commercial lead. So the way LiveRamp is structured is we have verticals and I work very closely with the vertical that my team supports, which is technology partnerships. And being able to align with him and promoting that from his side goes a long way. So it's not just I'm promoting it with my team. It's more of a collective effort. And what I've seen within the tech partnerships team is we are like a family. You see that shift, right? Where people are considering us part of their team. We're considering them part of our team. If you go into this thinking that there's always going to be a wall and there's always going to be channel conflict, which I've heard, I've heard between commercial teams and teams that are a little bit more technical, there's always this like conflict. It doesn't have to be that way. So I think aligning at the leads level and kind of trickling that down has been really helpful. And then also me building the relationships with the commercial team, right? All of the commercial leads outside of just who I work with has helped too, right? Because now it's not just, hey, I'm just going to connect with this person. Like I actually want to connect with all of you and I want to understand what your pain points are. So I think doing that has helped. And then again, as ICs run into these challenges continuing to encourage them. And then that same thing is happening on the commercial side. So now you're actually coming at this from both sides, right? And you're on the same page. And I think that's the part that people miss out on quite often. Totally understand that. So as you're talking about walking through or your methodology in terms of feedback, maybe you can give us some thoughts on like what your general approach into providing critical feedback is. When you're talking about critical feedback, again, this is the part that people struggle with the most, right? It's really important to level set why you're providing that feedback and why it's important, right? If you just kind of dive into it and basically just say whatever it is that you need to say, you can see a lot of defensive come back to you or you can see sadness or you can see different emotions, right? You want to keep the emotions out of this. I think it's important to basically make this practical and not emotions. Because when you start pulling emotions into it, then there's all sorts of responses and it's not really sticking. So level set why you're providing that feedback, encourage it to be a two-way conversation. So just because you're providing that feedback doesn't mean the other person just has to sit there and listen, right? It needs to be a two-way conversation. Be very specific, be sincere, timely. So if you ran into something that was of a challenge yesterday, don't wait three months before you provide that. That person needs to know. Try to make it actionable. So it's not just, hey, I'm throwing words at you. I actually am telling you what's going on. And then let's figure out together how we're going to address this. And I think that goes a long way too. And then again, balance the positive with the critical. That's really the approach that I use with my team. And, and I've seen a lot of success from being able to approach it this way. That's great. And I think I appreciate how much you've reiterated on balancing the critical feedback and the positive feedback. You know, sometimes I've heard like the feedback sandwich or whatever you want to call it, where it's like positive, negative, positive, or negative, positive, negative, whatever it might be, but it is mixing that in. Sometimes I do feel that depending on the amount of critical feedback or the depth of the feedback, you might only have one or two things you're allowed to talk about and you can kind of spin it positive, but it almost sometimes gets taken the wrong way if you're talking about something that's super serious and then you try to throw something positive in after. I have had situations where that has backfired on me personally. And actually, I would say you really need to be able to assess the situation. Sometimes it just makes sense to provide the critical feedback. When I say balance, I don't mean necessarily just in that conversation. I mean, overall, right? I think when you're working with other people, it's important to be able to highlight the things that they're doing well. Because if you're only giving critical feedback and never positive feedback, people can really take that in and start really questioning if they do add value or why they're in a role or things like that, right? It can turn very negative very quickly. And so I think when I say balance, really it's just over time as you're working with that person, if they're doing something really well, 
you know, don't like overlook it, actually tell them like, Hey, you're doing that well. So that when you are providing critical feedback, it doesn't come off as you're just attacking them. It comes off as like, Hey, we built this relationship and I'm giving you this feedback because I want to see you grow. I want to see you become better. And again, when you encourage it to be a two-way conversation, you're also saying, Hey, I also want to get that same thing from you. Right. Yeah. Positive intent is a big thing. It really is. When it comes to having these types of conversations, do you remember a specific time where maybe critical feedback wasn't taken well? And how did you manage that situation? Two times I can remember. One was when I was in IC working with a commercial counterpart. And one was when I was managing someone. With the commercial counterpart situation, it was a lot of defensiveness. And what I recognized there was that was someone that wasn't really open to getting that critical feedback because that was a personality that she had. And so recognizing kind of like where she stands and why she's reacting to comments was important. And then with the report, it was defensiveness a little bit, but then more just sadness. And I think when you're managing a team and you're giving a report critical feedback, as a manager, you might be very empathetic. And I think, again, when it comes to all of this and you start seeing someone get sad, it's very easy to take a step back and say, okay, I'm just going to now make this better or I'm not going to really like provide the whole thing because you know now I see sadness. I think really like stop yourself from doing that because they need to hear that, right? And the way I managed it was in both situations, again, kind of what I talked about before, communicate why you're providing that feedback. I always use the message. Anytime I'm running into conflict with anyone, I always tell them like, look, we're one team. We have one goal. We're together in this. And even though we're in different roles and you have different objectives and maybe different incentives, at the end of the day, we're part of the same company and we all want the same thing. And so reminding them of that really does help because it kind of calms down a lot of the feelings that they have when they hear something critical. And then again, re-communicate with that feedback as with examples, be specific, talk about the impact it's having, and then work with them to figure out how we can address it. And then again, encourage the two-way conversation. So it's not just, you know, I'm going to give you all of this feedback. If you have anything for me, please tell me, right? And so you want to show by example that when you want to create a culture of feedback, a lot of it has to come through example too and being able to receive that feedback as well. It's not just about providing. That makes me want to ask the question, how often do you ask your teams for feedback? It's important to have formal processes. And at Libram, basically, we go through this performance management quarterly, but it's also important to have informal processes. And so I encourage both, right? So informal, but also details regularly. Whenever the opportunity arises, when someone's doing well, tell them. When someone's doing something that is causing an issue for you, tell them, right? And that's informal feedback. Formal feedback, again, you really need to think about performance management and like, what are the data points you want to be able to collect and and how are you going to process that and be able to provide that visibility into the team? So I talked a little bit about what we do at LiveRam, but that's something that you should think about as far as the formal process goes. And how about though for your team giving you feedback? Have you seen the evolution of them being open and honest and giving you critical and actionable feedback? Yes. And you know, a lot of it is tied to the relationship that we've built. It's really built on trust. It's built on openness, right? I have weekly one-on-ones with my team and they definitely don't hesitate to tell me when they're running into challenges, whether it's with me or someone else or whatever they're working on, but you can see that openness and that comfortable feeling because we've worked a lot to build that. And that all comes through action, right? You can't build a environment of trust without actually executing, right? And so it's not just about the words. Like what my team recognizes is when I say things, it's not just the words that I'm using. Like they see it through action. And that's really the sticking point. Speaking of action, what are some ways to make positive feedback more actionable? This is a great question. And I think about this often. In my career, I've received a lot of positive feedback. I've given a lot of positive feedback. And what I've realized is that it's great to hear. But then I sit there and I think about, well, what can I do with this? Right. And so if you're just providing positive feedback, like you can get someone really happy and you can get them to work with you more, but that's not the intention. You want to make it actionable. And so the ways that I've found it to be actionable is anytime someone says, hey, 
you know, so-and-so on your team is doing a great job. I always say, oh, that's awesome. Thank you for providing that. Can you give me more details, right? So provide details, be specific. What are they doing well? Why is this creating a positive environment for you? Or what is this leading to? Because then if you have those details, you can encourage them to repeat the behavior. So whatever you're doing well, now you can encourage them to keep doing it, right? And then also frame it in the context of the bigger picture. Like what is the impact to the team, to the company? You know, every time, again, that I give positive feedback, I provide the details. And then, you know, I try to help them understand what does this mean for the bigger picture? And what that creates is value. People start understanding that the value that they're adding as an IC or a leader is so much bigger than just that little thing. And that's so important to be able to create in a company. If you want the company to scale, you want things to be more efficient, you want people to work better together... I mean, I've heard so many companies have so much conflict between different teams, right? Because everyone's incentivized differently or have different objectives. And so the more you can create this type of a culture, the more you're going to have efficiency at the end of the day and people being able to work together without it being like a war, right? (laughs) Right. And that's the worst kind of environment that you would want to be in. Well, Nithi, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I really like hearing your perspective. I've talked about feedback to a lot of people, but you have a really great perspective and I've really appreciated your insight. And I hope everybody listening will find it both valuable and actionable. So appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. And honestly, I could talk about this all day. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's so important. And also the one thing I will say is even when you get to a good place with creating that culture, keep focusing on it, you know, figure out like, could you be doing things better to create that culture and have that culture be stronger? So my advice to a lot of people that are in this position where you maybe have already created some sort of culture, it doesn't end there, right? This is a continuous thing and we have to all play a part in just continuously building it out. That's a great perspective because I was going to end with asking you two questions and one of them was some advice, but we just covered that one. So that was perfect. Let me ask you though, in general, what is your favorite thing about the pre-sales role? One, I mean, I love the idea of, again, solving clients' problems through technology and really kind of putting my consulting hat on. But being a manager, it's really about being able to empower my team to think very creatively, very strategically, to solve the pain points that the customers are feeling and being very proactive about identifying where are new revenue streams for the company? What could we be thinking about just outside of the day-to-day that we're doing? Like, I want my team to be very proactive and not reactive. And so being able to empower them to think that way and seeing them grow. I mean, I honestly like seeing them grow and learn has been so fulfilling for me. And so that's really honestly the favorite thing about the role. And then working at a company who's product and people I really trust and believe in. Well, Nithi, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed the conversation and we'll have to talk to you next time. Sounds great. Thanks so much, James. All right, Pre-Sales Collective. That was a great episode. want to thank Nithi again for her time today. I mean, hearing her perspective on how they're creating a culture of feedback at LiveRamp is so impressive. You know, creating a culture of feedback is something that And applicability is so hard to actually do. And to normalize feedback is incredibly tough. So again, kudos to Nithi and the team for what they're doing at LiveRamp. I thought her perspective was so impactful and so much appreciated. I found it valuable and I hope you did too. You know, in terms of main takeaways, I want to talk about the fact that giving and receiving constructive feedback is really tough, no matter how long you've been doing it in your career. When it comes to receiving feedback, we need to be in a position where we are receptive to that feedback and understand that mainly it is coming from a place of good intent. And sometimes we might need to practice a role play with our manager because if you do feedback effectively, it is so fundamental and foundational toward improved performance. If not, it sometimes can be a detractor. And so we need to become comfortable with the uncomfortableness of giving and receiving feedback. And really creating a culture of feedback instills trust and instills confidence. And when you do it consistently and it becomes regular, both formally and informally, it can really make your experience at a company extremely impactful and beneficial to your long-term growth. Okay, Pre-Sales Collective, that's all we have today. Thank you so much for listening. As always, please like, follow, share the Pre-Sales Podcast with your friends. If you liked today's episode, please post on LinkedIn. Let others hear it. 
And funny enough, I've been asking for feedback on the last couple of episodes. And so what more of a perfect time for you to let me know, good, bad, ugly, what's happening with the pre-sales podcast. Just reach out to me on our Slack channel. I really look forward to hearing your feedback. See you next week.